Bibles to John 12. It can be found on page 1126 in your pew Bibles. Listen to the word of God from the Gospel of John. We begin reading at verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, would, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He, as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. In the month of March, 1991, President George H.W. Bush was enjoying approval ratings that were just unbelievable. Ninety percent of the American voting public approved of the job that George H.W. Bush was doing. But within the space of, of, of a year and a half, those numbers flipped. They went from 90% approval to 64% disapproval by the month of August of, of 1992. And the reason? Well, the reason was in part a recession that was going on. And another presidential candidate at the time by the name of Bill Clinton, whose campaign manager who had come, had come up with a, a kind of a mantra for the rest of the campaign season. And that mantra you've probably heard before, the economy, stupid. And they wrote that mantra, focusing only on the economy, right into the White House. I don't know how many of you were surprised by the results of, of last Tuesday's primary election here in Michigan. Donald Trump won for the Republicans and, and Bernie Sanders for the Democrats. And it, it wouldn't be difficult to make a case for, for this too being all about the economy. Mr. Sanders' message is, is that that which stands between us and our fair share of the pie is that 1% that, that at the top, those wealthy Wall Street people, those bankers who, who consume all of, of our resources and, and leave little for the rest of the American public. Mr. Trump points uh, more frequently to the, to the bottom of the spectrum and says it's those undocumented immigrants that come pouring through. We need to stop that and then we will enjoy a more robust sort of, of prosperity. And whichever narrative you, you choose to believe or sign on to, well, in the end, it all is ab about the economy. It's, it's about, about the bottom line, about what, what comes in for us. We've been following Jesus as he travels towards Jerusalem in, in this last trip. And, and we find him here at, at this place that if, if anywhere was his home, it's, it's this. He's, he's there with, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, dear friends of his. He's, he's reclining at a meal, and it is just a beautiful scene until 
what comes up? The subject of money. And all of a sudden, everything is disturbed as, as, as the question is raised about how much was spent. We were told when we first became missionaries that there were three things that you mustn't talk about with other missionaries. I forget the other two, but one of them was how, how other missionaries spend their money. You don't touch that. It creates disunity on the field. But here we are with Jesus, with his disciples, with, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and right in the middle of this beautiful scene, we have the question of, of corruption and campaign financing and, and priorities and, and efficiencies and, and outcomes. It's, it's like we're back in campaign season. It's all about the economy. And so we're going to talk a, a little bit about, about the economics of Lent, the economy of Lent. But before we get there, we're going to take a look at this incredibly beautiful scene as, as the gospel writer John sets it up. It's a, a picture that anticipates the coming kingdom of God. It's a banquet prepared in Jesus' honor and shared by Jesus' closest friends. You know, we're not exactly sure how much time has, has elapsed between chapter 11 and chapter 12. In chapter 11, we have the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus calls Lazarus out from the tomb. And a little while later, in chapter 12, we find Jesus coming back, and they're putting on a banquet in his honor. They're, they're welcoming him back to this home. And you can imagine as you walk into a home where a meal has been prepared, the, the, the wonderful sensation of the warmth of the, the kitchen, the smells of the food that have been prepared. Everybody's there, all your friends, the, the people who are close to you. And all of a sudden, there's another smell that, that, that fills the house. And it's the smell of this incredible fragrance, the smell of this incredible perfume. Stephen Shoemaker describes the, the, the scene of, of the people who were there in, in this way. There was Martha, busy Martha, who had made the supreme confession of faith in the chapter before. And as Jesus had come to the house, Martha had said to Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And he goes on, there was Lazarus, over whom Jesus had wept, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, who was now trying to figure out how to live the rest of his resurrection life. And there was Mary, the ideal disciple of Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42, who sat at Jesus' feet and learned from him. The supper echoes earlier meal, signs of the breaking in kingdom, and peers forward to Jesus' last supper with his disciples. And, and, and there they are, they're, they're enjoying this supper, and, and they are overtaken by this smell of perfume that fills the whole house. And if we, we pause there to think about fragrant offerings, if, if we go back in, in the Bible and, and look at the book of, of Exodus where instructions were given for the tabernacle, in, in chapter 30 in particular, there's a whole series of descriptions about how to offer a, a fragrant incense, a fragrant sacrifice. And it becomes clear that the house of worship was to be a place of rich and luxurious smells. If you look at the writings of the Apostle Paul, too, which were, were penned before this gospel was, you see to the Ephesians that he describes Christ's sacrifice as a fragrant offering to God. And to the Ephesians, or to the, to the Philippians, he writes of their gifts as, as, as fragrant sacrifices before God. And, and so we get, we get a sense of of what it's like to be in this aromatic environment as they gather together with Jesus Christ just a week before the celebration of the Passover and just a week and a day or so before Jesus Christ becomes our Passover. 
This image of fragrance, of pleasure carried by the air itself, inhaled and shared by all who come into contact with it. We remember that words for, for the spirit in both Hebrew and Greek are also related to breath and wind. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You get the idea of an atmosphere permeated by a certain kind of grace. But as nice and lovely as all that sounds, there is the practical matter of what it costs, the economy, once again. And so we find ourselves after this moving scene with the closest thing that Jesus had to a family and with objections to what had just happened because of money. Again, money is one of those things you don't discuss in polite company, but how polite are families anyway? So Judas says, that perfume cost $50,000. Can you imagine? Well, can you? A year's wages. Maybe it was more, maybe it was less. But, but just think being in a gathering and, and having something, some kind of, of demonstration of, of, of reverence or affection that, that is spent and gone and wasted. I mean, if somebody blew $500 on something like that, we'd, we'd think it's quite a bit. We would call $5,000 extravagant. But a whole year's wages, whatever that may be, I mean, that's, that's reason to leave someone scratching his or her head. Well, John, the gospel writer, goes after it one way. He, he immediately discredits Judas. He reminds us that Judas was going to betray Jesus. And he gives us some more information as well. He tells us that, that, that Judas was the, the treasurer for the group and that, that Judas, from time to time, would, would skim from the, from the group's accounts. He would take money as he needed it from the common pot I couldn't help but wonder if, if we found out that some campaign manager was stealing campaign funds and the candidate knew about it while it was happening, what would happen to that candidate? But, but it reinforces Jesus', Jesus teaching and, and policy of, of letting the, the weeds grow with the wheat, that Judas is, is still there, Judas is still at this table. John, John goes after him by discrediting him and so, apparently, we shouldn't worry so much about his objection, but, but he also reports Jesus' response to that objection, because we wonder, too, don't we? I mean, that much money? Really? Was, was it necessary, our, our acts of worship, to be that extravagant? So John gives us what, what Jesus says in reply. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Two things come to mind as we hear this. The first, of course, is that, that Jesus is about to die. Shortly before this, in this very place in chapter 11, we saw Jesus call Lazarus out from the grave. And, and it was interesting that as Jesus talked with, with one of Lazarus' sisters, there was, there was concern about, about the smell. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. But the stench of death was not there. And in the place of death, there was life. Lazarus was right there at the table. And now in preparing for Jesus' death, this anointing of his body, this fragrant sacrifice, was yet another way of anticipating the life to come. Yes, Jesus would die, but it was, it was important to show the continuity between, between the life that he lived and the life that he would pick up again after his death. And this anointing with this exceptionally extravagant perfume demonstrated that. And Mary, Mary 
was often described as, as sitting in rapt attention at Jesus' feet. Mary may have been the only one to truly understand what was going on. But when Jesus says, you will always have the poor among you, he, he isn't just saying or also saying that, uh, that, that, that they would be there and, and he wouldn't because Jesus had always said that that he was with the poor as well. This is the same Jesus who had taught them, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Could it not also be true that, that whatever one does for Jesus, one, one does for the poor? It's important for us to note that, that Jesus was quoting scripture when, when he says, the poor you will always have with you. I can remember a time a, a long time ago when someone kind of shirking their responsibilities to be generous, to give of the resources that they had, quoted this passage to me. Well, Jesus himself said, the poor you'll always have with you, so, so why worry about it? Why, why bother yourself? Well, it's important to note that this is a quotation from Scripture. It's from, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 15. And in Deuteronomy chapter 15, we read these words, beginning at verse 7. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Give generously to him and do it so without a grudging heart. Then, because of the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your hand. Loving the poor was not just an occasional activity. It was, for Jesus, a lifestyle. And all throughout his ministry, he poured his life into those who, who followed him, into, into the lepers, into the destitute, into the outcast. When we talk about the passion of Jesus Christ, uh, a big part of it had to do with his ministry to those who were thrown outside of society, those who were poor. A word about the word passion. Passion is derived from, from Latin and Greek words that have to do with, with suffering. Passion doesn't mean that anymore, does it? Passion has, has come to mean something, it's come to be something of an emotional buzzword. We talk about our passions on our resumes as we try to sell our enthusiasms to other people. I'm passionate about, about this or that or the next thing. And what we want to say is that, that we feel deeply, we feel strongly about one thing or another. And yet it comes from words that, that, that aren't so much enthusiasms as those deep feelings, those deep feelings of pain and suffering. I guess it's not hard to understand how they're related. They're both very deep, very profound. And when we talk about the passion of Christ, we talk about that which, which was deepest in him, that which he felt the most. And when we look at, at the sacrifice, when we look at, at what Mary did, well, she's, she's silent here in this passage as well. But we know her from the Gospel of Luke to be one of the most perceptive of Jesus' disciples. Unlike busy Martha, she's absorbed Jesus' teaching like a sponge. And, and while everyone else is eager to deny Jesus' upcoming death, well, perhaps Mary understood that. She knew what was coming. And in this passionate act of letting down her hair and anointing his feet, she not only prepares him for burial, but she joins herself to him. She pours out a year of her life on his feet, and the fragrance fills the house. 
in the face of death, who counts the cost anymore? Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, is less than a week away from celebrating his last Passover meal, and he's just over a week away from becoming our Passover meal. And surely the inner struggle that became visible in the garden where he sweat great drops of blood is already stirring in him. And so Jesus welcomes Mary's passionate act. He was about to pour out his own life, welcomes someone who poured out her life and her livelihood over him in preparation for his death. The economy of Lent. Before I, I say anything else about how this all applies to us, I'd like to say a few more words about the economy of Lent in the, in the Gospel of John. A number of authors commentated about how this gospel this gospel demonstrates how, how Jesus manages to create abundance where there is scarcity. And, and a number of people talked about the, the bookends to Jesus' ministry, how, how Jesus' ministry in John began with that incredible wedding at Cana where they ran out of wine and Jesus, instead of providing a couple of bottles until the bar closed, Jesus turned water into wine, and, and there were as many as 180 gallons left for the wedding to enjoy, to continue their celebration, an extravagant and, and, and ridiculously expensive gift. And here at the end of his public ministry, we find himself once again in this environment of, of abundance, of extravagance. This man who didn't have a place to lay his own head has someone pouring $50,000 worth of perfume over his feet. Where there appears to be scarcity, in the world of Jesus Christ, there is abundance. And of course, looking at his ministry, looking back at that, that time when he was teaching by the, by the Sea of Galilee, and, and everyone was hungry, and they were too far to get, to get anything to eat, and he asked his disciples, and they don't know what to say, there's, there's a kid here with a little bit of food. Again, instead of, of snack packages that you get on the air, airplane while you fly across the country, Jesus provided everything that everyone could eat. And there were 12 baskets of leftovers. And after this story, when, when Jesus goes out to see Peter while he's fishing again, he tells him to cast the nets on the other side. And, and once again, it's been a long night of nothing. Like, like us so often, our endeavors are met without the kinds of results that we desire. But Jesus tells Peter to try again. He throws the nets on the other side. And, and 153 whoppers show up in his net, so many and so big that they wind up breaking his nets. Over and over again, Jesus shows his followers incredible abundance, ridiculous extravagance, where there was once only adversity and scarcity. Mary understands the extravagant abundance of life with Jesus. She's not after a reward for the biggest donor. She's not trying to get the most bang for her buck. She's not using her money to leverage her influence She's joining Jesus in his passion. She's uniting her life with his. Can you measure the results? Probably not. Is there a spreadsheet where you can enter this data? I, I don't think so. A word about what we have just done this morning. This is the one time of the year when, when you get to see Stephen ministers. After this week, they'll kind of disappear, and you won't hear about them. Maybe they'll show up in the prayer guide once in a while, but you don't know who they're ministering to. They won't report to you. They won't report to me. They just go about their work. All you need to know is that they're there. Their goal is not to fix anything. 
They understand that only Jesus can do that. Their goal is not to leverage their influence or have something named after them for their contributions. What they do is guarded by their own pledge of confidentiality. In many cases, I won't even know who they're looking after. No one but the people they care for are aware of what they do. They've agreed to put into practice the economy of Lent without thought for practicalities or efficiencies and without tying their efforts to a certain set of outcomes. They're pouring out their lives for and on behalf of others. With Mary, they're anointing Jesus for his burial. With Mary, they're serving the poor. And with Mary, they're pouring out their lives over the one who poured out his life to save all of us. But it's not just Stephen ministers who are invited to live in this economy of Lent, this strange place of scarcity and ridiculous abundance. It's all of us. Judas's questions about how much was spent are good ones, but, but you know when you're facing death, your priorities shift. And we're all facing death every day. Instead of hoarding, you pour out. Instead of calculating, you simply give. Instead of waiting, you get on with it. You look to the one who is laying down his life for you. And you pour your life into that. As hard as it may be to believe, even for Jesus, it's all about the economy. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, for the example of Mary's sacrifice, as she recognized what her Lord and Savior was about to do, for her willingness to, to give up so much of what she had, to, to lay her life at, at your feet, we give you thanks. Father, you remind us every day that our lives are fleeting, that they are temporary, that we are mortal. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that, that you will help us to live with the awareness that certainly Mary and Martha and Lazarus had after his death and resurrection, that all of this is passing. May we, too, adopt the economy of Lent. May we pour out our lives before you. May we eagerly become part of the sacrifice that you make for us in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Father, we ask all these things in the name of the one who loved us and poured out his life on our behalf. In the name of Jesus, amen.